But if you turn back to uh, Daniel chapter 10, and as we follow through, as we look through this passage, ever since uh, a young lad, as far back as I can remember, I've been fascinated with stories of the secret services, particularly British secret services. Uh, they operate behind closed doors, don't they? The MI5, MI6, you can see some of the buildings in, in London. And they, they, they work tirelessly in the shadows, safeguarding us as a nation from unseen threats. Uh, they have so much to do, and so much of their work will never be known or seen by us. They're infiltrating extremist groups. They're covertly gathering information electronically and, uh, and so on, intercepting, decrypting, analyzing information, all to keep us safe. A lot of things never happen in our cities and in our country because of their work behind the scenes. Only every, every now and again does their secret work break out into public. And then we realize that the work they've been doing in following people, in protecting the public, the secret work suddenly breaks out into the open and we go, oh, there are people there. They are doing things. We didn't see it. We didn't know it. But they were at work. Often the real warfare in our country doesn't happen on the battlefield with gun and bullet, but at computer desks um, with people behind desks in offices with spies undercover in this country and other countries. And it seems so distant and so unknown that we might e even forget that they exist. Only now and again is the curtain pulled back and we go, yes, they actually do exist. And as we see, first of all, in Daniel, this is what we have. There, there is a secret work behind the scenes that every now and again comes to appear before our eyes. And we say, actually, there is something going on more than what we see around us in the church. There are more than pews and windows and people and clocks. There are, there are spiritual forces at work. And so this is what we see. Firstly, we, we get a, a peek behind the scenes in Daniel 10 into the secretive spiritual warfare that is constantly going on in the heavenly places. We're in the third year of Cyrus's reign of, in Persia. We meet Daniel, as I've said, he's now 87 years old. Unlike the Babylonians who'd had him captive before this, they used to capture uh, countries and enslave people, take them back to their homeland, use them as servants and slaves in their palaces and homes. But the Persians had a different tactic, and their tactic was to keep people that they had captive in their own countries so they could work their own fields and do their own businesses and then pay tribute and food back to Persia. Well, as Jeremiah had foretold, and we saw this last week, after 70 years of exile, the Persian king gives them permission to go back to their homeland. There they can do their work and pay tribute to him from their own homes. Two years have gone by since Cyrus gave them permission. If you want to read more about this, you can read it in Ezra chapter 1. Cyrus had said to them two years before this, go home. Rebuild whatever you want to do um, and send me tribute. But two years had come and gone, and only a very few had made that journey back home. Most had become comfortable in their land here in Babylon, now overtaken by Persia. It settled down. They'd been there for 70 years. Their children had grown up there. Why would they want to go back to Jerusalem? Because they loved the, the prosperity and the their health and the education of Babylon. Why would they want to go back to Jerusalem, which had been destroyed and crumbled and have to rebuild? And so very few had returned. Not only that, for those who had returned and begun to rebuild their homes, they'd faced extreme opposition from the Samaritans, who were neighbors of theirs. The Samaritans had written to Cyrus, asking him, not to allow them to take any materials for rebuilding 
And Cyrus had agreed over the last two years that the Jews on returning couldn't take any or buy any materials. So here in verses two and three, Daniel is grieving. He's grieving over the lack of people who've returned. He's grieving over the lack of rebuilding, the opposition of the Samaritans. He's mourning that uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, was not allowing them to rebuild. What do we read in verse 2? In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself. He didn't wash himself for these three weeks till three whole weeks were fulfilled. We meet a man who is disheartened by the work of the Lord, by the progress of these post-exile believers and their lack of rebuilding efforts. He had expected, hadn't he? We saw this last week. After 70 years in exile, they would be enthused. They would be passionate. They would be like, I cannot wait to get home, to see the friends and family that were dispersed so many years ago, to rebuild my house and to rebuild the temple. And there'd be this deep spirituality and this longing for the presence of God. But everything has come to a miserable halt. It had left him bitterly disappointed, both by the people and the world around him. And so he grieves for three whole weeks. But at the end of this time of grieving and of prayer, we meet a heavenly messenger who comes down and meets with him and unveils the reasons why everything is ground to a halt. And it's not just to do with Cyrus or the Samaritans or the people who have returned. Because this heavenly messenger unveils the hidden realm of powerful spiritual forces, revealing that the challenge that they were facing went beyond apathy or opposition or powerful kings. There is more, to play, more at play, says the messenger, than meets the human eye. What we see here is remarkable, and you've got to bear with me a moment, because maybe you're not used to this kind of language, but it's what we see here and throughout Scripture, that behind the scenes of what we see here in church life, there is a spiritual fight going on with Christ and his angels fighting against, in hostility against, Satan and his fallen angels, the demons as we call them, who are constantly manipulating situations behind the scenes to hinder the ongoing work of God. Notice in verse 12 and 13, this messenger tells him, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, that's three weeks ago, and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, three weeks. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. <clears throat> so here we have this past three weeks. Daniel has been grieving, praying. Behind the scenes, says this messenger, unseen spiritual battles, conflicts have been taking place, have been unfolding in the heavenly realms. Christ, because that is who this messenger is, as we'll see in a moment, Christ and his chief angel, he says, Michael, had been engaging in combat against this mysterious prince of Persia. Now, this is not Cyrus, the king of Persia, but a fallen angel who has been influencing this idol-worshipping king who was then hindering God's work back in Jerusalem. Paul, the Apostle Paul, later warns in 1 Corinthians 10.20, that the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons and are a participation with the work of demons. And this is what the king of Persia 
was. He was a worshipper of idols. And as Paul would say to him, he was participating in the wrong side. He was participating in the work of demons as he bowed before his stone and wood idols. Although we often overlook it, there is a covert spiritual battle constantly raging for and against the gospel and the work and worship of God. And it's this hidden struggle where the true battle, where the true spiritual battle is unfolding before it ever comes down and meets with us in the realities, in the physical realm of our world. The early 20th century um, prime minister of Netherlands, he was a Christian, a theologian, Abraham Kuyper. He once wrote this, he said, if once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came to view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range, that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem by comparison a mere game. Not here, he says, but up there. That is where the real conflict is waged. Daniel is seeing that the issues of his day surpass the mere spiritual indifference of his people or the neighborly opposition of the Samaritans or the powerful king of Persia. What he is being shown is that the battle is raging in the heavenlies, that they, it encompasses this powerful demonic force that is exerting influence over territories and nations, employing manipulation and temptation and twisted logic to amplify the evil of the world and to weaken God's work on earth. Remember, back in the Garden of Eden, this, this spiritual force came in the form of a serpent slithering up to Adam and, Eve and, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Then later in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same spiritual power, Satan himself, comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to destroy the work of God and his grace. When people run away from God, it's not because of some logical conclusion that they've come to. Paul tells us why people run away from God in 1 Corinthians. He says it's because the God of this age, the spiritual realm, the evil one, the God of this age has blinded the eyes of those who will not believe on earth. It's a remarkable picture, insight we have here, that Satan, along with his prince of Cardiff, his demons over Gabalva, they are masterfully orchestrating spiritual darkness. They're organizing, they're deceiving, they're destroying with the aim of thwarting the gospel, and the work of God in our community and our city. This isn't just a physical battle or our abilities to tell someone clearly the gospel, although that's part of it. There is more going on than just us telling someone else about Jesus. The spiritual forces are blinding people's eyes, confusing, tempting, distracting, saying look this way rather than look to the gospel. This is what the Apostle Paul has in mind when he writes to God's people in Ephesus. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil, he says, in the heavenly places in Ephesians 6. So when we watch the news tonight, local and national and international, when we see struggles in Gabalva, and even when we look within and see our own personal temptations, like nothing can be fully understood just through our physical eyes or through historical events or natural explanations here and there. All of the things that we see on earth, all of the news that we watch, 
are exhibitions of an unseen yet relentless conflict between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness, between Christ and Satan, who is the prince of the power of this air, of the air. Whether we like it or not, we are all entangled in a spiritual battle. As Daniel was in verse 15, as we understand this, we can be rendered speechless and humbled when we comprehend the magnitude of what is going on behind the scenes. Daniel has never really thought through this before, and as Christ shows him what is going on and why the work is being hindered, he simply cannot speak. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But he realizes that everyone who belongs to the kingdom of heaven is now seated in the heavenly places in Christ, and therefore they are inevitably involved in a greater battle than before. We must grasp this morning that while the evil prince of the power of the air seeks to discourage you and destroy our church and hinder the work of God here, these forces are inherently weaker than the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what is shown to us here. Secondly, Daniel, who has been so upset and so anxious up until this point, we see him falling to the ground, we see him shaking, we see him speechless, and then he receives an extraordinary visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There's no doubt that this is the Christ. The description that he gives is almost exactly the same as Ezekiel in Ezekiel 1, same as the Apostle John in Revelation 1. Daniel witnesses this figure dressed in linen, adorned with the gold of Euphaz, radiating a body like beryl, a face shining like lightning, eyes blazing like fire, arms and feet resembling burnished bronze, a voice like a multitude. This figure, this mysterious figure is so glorious that Daniel describes him with the most precious metals of earth, with the greatest meteorological events of the heavens. He says, this is a glorious, wonderful, beautiful, overwhelming figure. For in the midst of all of our spiritual battles, the most important view any of us need is to see the awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. That nothing can overcome him. That nothing can win the day against him. When we witness his glory, our faith is strengthened and we are reminded of his power and his authority and victory over darkness. Seeing Christ renews Daniel's perspective. It affirms that God is sovereign and in control, even in the face of these ghastly spiritual challenges against the work of God. This view of the beauty of Christ draws Daniel closer to him. It ignites in him a desire to worship the living God, to seek intimacy with him. Satan comes and seeks to get a foothold in the kingdom of heaven. We see Christ and all those fears that we might have are dispelled. We, of all things, when we consider the spiritual forces at work, must focus not primarily on the spiritual forces and the battles and the conflicts in the heavenlies, but focus on the overwhelming beauty and majesty of Christ. The second person of the Trinity leaves Daniel overwhelmed. He collapses unconscious in the face of such resplendence. Remember Ezekiel, in, as he sees Christ, he describes it as so awesome that he couldn't help but fall on, the fa on his face to the floor before him. And Daniel here, he meets the holy the all-powerful Son of Man, the same being he'd previously seen, if you remember, in the vision, ascending through the clouds to be with his Father in heaven. He'd seen Christ in vision. Now he comes face to face with a personal 
meeting with the, the Son of God. Why has Christ come? Why is Christ meeting with him? He's come to inform him that he doesn't need to be discouraged by the circumstances of the kingdom, the failing, as it seems, work of God back in Jerusalem. He's come to inform him of the spiritual battle going on behind the scenes, but also to inform him, do not fear, Daniel, because I will win the day. This conflict is ongoing, but I will be successful. The battle, says Christ, in verse 13, has been going on for the last three weeks. The struggle has been so hard that Christ had called on the angel Michael to help him, and he is winning, and he will win. After all, who is this Christ? Who is this Christ? Well, do you remember Joshua in the battle of Jericho, the day before the battle, um, Joshua meets the Lord Jesus Christ himself, this glorious figure with a drawn sword. And, and Joshua goes to him and says, are you on our side? Are you on Israel's side? And Christ responds, no, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Christ tells Joshua, I am the commander of the armies of the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. I govern them. I lead them out. I win the battles. Jericho will fall. And similarly, Christ has come to Daniel with that same idea in mind. I'm the commander of heaven's spiritual forces. Do not worry about the work way, way 500 miles west in Jerusalem. Don't worry about that. I've got this. I'm winning this, and I will win. How do we know that Christ will win the day? How do we know that Christ will beat off the evil one? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22, tell us he already has won the day. For God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's put all things under Christ's feet. He's given him as head over all things for the church. Because Christ rose again, defeating death and hell and destruction, defeating the evil one himself upon the cross by rising again on the third day. It's from this place of authority, Christ comes to all opposing forces. And he says, you think you can beat me? What can you do against me? You've already killed me and I beat that. What can you do? You cannot win against Christ. Because he's risen from the dead and God has placed him at the right hand in the place of authority and majesty below whom all things must bow and fear. So no matter what Israel's ongoing weaknesses or their continued opposition, opposition were, they would win for Christ was with them. Christ was with them. And this is our hope as we battle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. As we fight against temptations, as we fight against the deception of the evil one with our friends, as we seek to tell them the gospel and there seems to be a veil across their eyes, we say, how can I ever get through? I just can't get through. This is our hope. Christ is our hope. He does win. He has won. He will win. And we are seated with him, says Ephesians, in the place of victory. With Christ, we are in the heavenly places already in Christ. We are fighting with Christ in this spiritual battle. Daniel's view here of the Lord is to remind him 
and to remind us that we're never alone in the struggle against this evil force. Christ will send us, as he did Daniel, he will send us ministering angels. Hebrews 1 tells us this, doesn't it? Christ will send us ministering spirits to serve us because we've inherited his salvation. For heaven is able to break through into our earth to help us in our time of need. Constantly through scripture, Old and New Testament, we see heaven breaking through, angels comforting, Christ presencing himself. Heaven, the heavenly forces of Christ break through into our world to comfort us, to strengthen us, to enable us to keep going and to live for him. Just read Daniel and you see the, the many times heaven breaks through. There is Daniel alone in the lion's den. Heaven breaks through and Christ meets with him. You see the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. There's a fourth man there. Heaven breaks through. Christ is with his people. The presence of the risen Lord can bring great comfort to those who are battling the weariness of trials and temptations. Because in our spiritual warfare, Christ is with us. Christ breaks through and he says, where you are, I am. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Heaven breaks through to us, but can we break through to heaven? Can we break through into these spiritual forces and influence them for good? Well, this is what we see thirdly, and we see this in the book of Daniel again and again. For here we are promised armor to protect us and prayer to communicate with our commander in heaven. Come back to verse 1 of Daniel 10. Literally, it says in, in verse 1, um, it's not so clear in the New King James, unfortunately, but in, in literally it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel. Its message was true, and it concerned a great conflict. The word conflict appears there. And when you first read that in Daniel 10, 1, you, you think it's this conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Persians. Jews on one side, and Samaritans and Persians on the other. But soon as you read Daniel 10, you realize that the, the conflict is greater than that. that. This is a conflict between heaven and hell, between Christ and Satan. This spiritual warfare of the heavens is, is being played out in flesh and blood human beings on earth, in Persia, in Jerusalem, next to Jerusalem with their neighbors. It's, it's being played out in the real world. And Daniel is being a part of this too, uh, unknowingly at first, but as he goes through Daniel 10, he becomes more knowingly a part of the spiritual battle in the heavens. Here is Daniel. He's, he's too old to return to Jerusalem. He's too old to help in the rebuilding. He, he feels weak and helpless in this conflict. But in reality, though he is still in Persia, Though he's not rebuilding himself, though he has not even gone back home himself because he's unable to, he is accomplishing the most important work of all. He's praying. He's grieving over sin. With passion and with grief, with overwhelming anguish. In prayer, he's breaking through into the heavens more than the rest of the people. I remember years ago in a church I was in visiting an, an elderly gentleman. He'd just had a stroke and I uh, went to see him. He'd, he'd had multiple strokes over the last couple of years and he couldn't get out of his chair. And throughout his life, he'd been massively active in the Christian church. He'd been head of a denomination. He'd been preaching out every week. He'd been seeing people saved. And here he was now. He was bent over in this chair, unable to do anything. And he began explaining to me how upset he was, how much grief he had. He said, I'm unable to do anything for God anymore. Can't do anything. I remember saying to him 20 years ago or so, brother, you might not be able to preach. You might never be able to knock a door again. 
The church needs your prayers. That's what we need. Because you might never get out of this chair, but you have the most vital task of all. You can break through into the heavens through seeking God's face in prayer. Prayer is the way to find breakthrough in powerful spiritual battles. Maybe there's a temptation that's just overcoming you. Are you praying about it? Maybe there's a friend that just stubbornly holds on to their unbelief. Are you earnestly praying about it? Because there's a battle for our hearts and souls and minds. And prayer always has a meaningful impact on every battle we face. This was Paul's whole emphasis when he wrote about it in Ephesians. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Pray in the spirit, he says, on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. He's talking about the spiritual battle. He's saying you can break through into the heavens. Pray. Take up the shield of faith. Mary, Queen of Scots, is reputed to have said that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies that she faced. She was aware, wasn't she, that prayer has more power and influence than any superpower, any army, however well equipped they are. It's how we participate in the spiritual battle that rages on and on against us each and every day. It's little wonder if we have few victories over sin or in the spread of the gospel, if we aren't a passionately praying people. It's the most important work we can do before everything we do, in everything we do, after everything we do, Prayer must be what we're saturated in. This is not about ticking boxes and doing devotionals and about being able to say, I was at the prayer meeting this week. This is much more than that. This is about war. This is engaging with the enemy. This is joining forces with the captain of the Lord's army as he engages the evil one, as he breaks through into flesh and blood circumstances. We must break through to him in the heavenly places. Daniel's disciplined and passionate prayers meant that though he was an 87-year-old man, 500 miles from Jerusalem, he was having a greater effect on that city and its rebuilding and its overcoming the opposition and beating and changing Persia's mind on the situation. He was having a greater effect upon those than all the young families who had returned and who had not prayed about it. Here is a man who wouldn't even live to see the answers to his prayers, but he knew they would be answered. And so continued in the work and thought nothing else, but I can't do anything, but I can pray. That's the power of prayer. This is where Christ meets with his people. When you get home, reread this chapter and notice how repeatedly it talks about Daniel's weaknesses, his fears, his fainting constantly, his crumbling to the floor in unconsciousness, his attempts to get back up onto his hands and and feet, his inability in the face of his vision of Christ and the heavenly realm. It's, It's remarkable how much weakness Daniel has, according to Daniel 10. But it's remarkable because Christ is clearly saying to him that in him being stripped of all his physical strength, he's being stripped of it by Christ in order that Christ might be his strength, that prayer would be his only recourse. He can't physically do anything, but he can cry out to God. Of course, prayer in itself isn't powerful. But in our abject weaknesses, prayer connects us to true and glorious power, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Yes, we are too weak in ourselves this morning to accomplish anything for the Lord. But through prayer, we fight the spiritual battles around us 
knowing that Christ, the conquering captain, will hear our prayers and accomplish his work. So as we leave this morning, look to him. Look to him. If you've never got into the habit of prayer, begin that habit today. Grow in prayer. Grow in your belief that prayer is working before God and breaking into the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And maybe this morning you are darkened in your understanding. You do not believe in God or the good news of the gospel. Then pray. Ask God, open my eyes that I might see Jesus Christ in all his wonder and glory, that I might understand for myself. If you are struggling this morning in your spiritual fight, then pray. Pray. Knowing that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. Because they pull down strongholds. They cast down arguments. They, they throw down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. They bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The battle is real. Christ is the answer. And prayer is our most important work. And so our last hymn this morning serves as this rallying cry for our church to rise up in the face of spiritual opposition and the unseen battles that surround us. It calls us to action, reminding us again that we are not mere spectators in this work, but we are actively engaged in a much greater work than we can imagine as we are a part of this ongoing conflict between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So let's stand and sing, O Church, Arise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.